Pickleball has exploded in popularity across the country, especially in New York City, where 14 pickleball courts recently opened in Central Park's Woman Rink. Here's a look at Woman Rink before the courts open. And here it is now, just in time for National Pickleball Month. It's being called the largest pickleball installation in the Northeast. Joining us now is Carl Schmitz. He is the Managing Director of Facilities and Equipment Standards at the USA Pickleball Association. Yeah, um, it's great. So great to have you. Uh, so for those who may just be waking up to what the sport is, what is pickleball and how is it different from other racquetball sports like tennis, racquetball, and I guess maybe badminton? Yeah, well, the, the sport's been around for well over 50 years now. Um, as uh, most people describe it, it's a combination of, of elements of tennis, badminton, and ping pong. It's played on a badminton-sized court over a net that's uh, slightly lower than a tennis net. Um, it's played with a, a plastic ball and a solid paddle, as you can see there in the image. And uh, it is, I think, one of the reasons why it's, it's become so popular uh, is because it's got a very low barrier of entry. Um, I do like to describe the sport, um, you know, in that it's, it's got the dynamic range of golf, the, the precision of the putting green, uh, the finesse of the approach, and the power off the tee, uh, then raise it to an aerobic level of exercise. So it's, um, it's become popular for a number of reasons. Uh, it's very social. And uh, again, that uh, that low barrier of entry has uh, has meant many people have been able to enjoy it. Um, the difference between other you know other uh, uh, sports such as tennis, uh, badminton, and racquetball, um, it, it doesn't take uh, it doesn't take a lot of uh, uh, physical prowess to get started. Um, you can play it you know at your own pace, uh, regardless of your fitness level. Um, but as time goes, as you get in better and better shape, and uh, discover. You know, there are layers of strategy to the sport. Uh, it becomes uh, a little bit like sweaty chess. And, uh, <laughs> and so it's, it, it continues to give you a, uh, an increasing bar uh, to, for, you know, for a, a focus on improvement. Um, so it's, um, yeah, I think those are the you know, key drivers behind its growth. Uh, and again, you know, the difference is uh, one other difference between some of the, the other uh, racket sports is that um, those sports, you know, they, they are a very high speed. Uh, in most cases, uh, this sport can be played, you know, low and slow. Uh, but you know, again, once you're comfortable with it, uh, it can be sped up. And, and uh, in fact, you've got you know synapse searing uh, shootouts that you'll see uh, if you've ever watched any of the pro level play. Uh, Carl, how much has the popularity popularity of it with some some big names? I, I live down south, and you have Drew Brees, who everybody in New Orleans and people know he's a Super Bowl winning quarterback. Folks like that are jumping into the sport and saying, hey, this is great. How much does that help raise their profile? It's been here 50 years, but 50 years, we, they were talking about it on the national news. Yeah, it's, uh, the, you know, the last uh, 12 months have been uh, staggering in terms of the number of names that have come into the sport. Uh, LeBron James, Tom Brady. Uh, just last weekend, you know, we saw McEnroe and, and <laughs> Agassi, uh, Chang, and, um, uh, and, uh, it was, uh, you know, it was a fantastic event. It brought a lot of visibility to the sport. Um, it just seems like uh, you know, the, the media flurry around this has been uh, staggering here the last 18 months or so, um, and then even more so here the last year, uh, last year. So a lot of celebrities and then uh, a lot of athletes, professional athletes, getting into it as well. Well, the other thing, I guess, that's become probably a bit of a challenge here in New York City, as you probably know, is there are people who are complaining about these new pickleball courts, and, and in fact, the people who play pickleball, because what you have now is adults. I don't see, it's interesting, I don't see a lot of kids playing pickleball. I see a lot of adults, uh, older people, you know, at least when I mean adults, I mean people above the age of 18. Mm -hmm. And But when you get like, you know, 40 and 50 year olds, uh, entitled New Yorkers, uh, <laughs> who think that they have a right to do whatever it is that they want, and even push younger children who are playing sports out of the courts or off the, you know, wherever they play these. I mean, these are the things that people are dealing with right now. And you're starting to hear from neighborhood associations that it's getting very, very heated. Um, what can, is, is there anything the league can do to address these concerns that people have for the fans, the people who don't play pickleball? Sure. Uh, I mean, there, there, there needs to be an equitable approach to providing you know, recreational resources. Um, so municipalities are working hard to try to find that balance. I um, mean, if they do have available budget and space, clearly being able to build um, purpose-built uh, uh, facilities to address this growth um, is the ideal method. Um, in the absence of that, though, they do have to look at how do we balance uh, the existing assets, uh, you know, within a 
uh, uh, recreational uh, environment uh, to address uh, address all constituents, right? Um, so there is a an equitable approach that um, ideally uh, will help address both the growth uh, as well as those that exist um, and are still looking for support uh, within playgrounds and and uh, tennis facilities and other existing. Uh, recreational facilities. Hmm. I mean, listen, municipalities are getting involved too. Down south where I live, there's, you know, something before a city council where they want to turn two tennis courts into multiple pickleball courts. And of course, they get the government involved because the popularity of it is growing. You mentioned the last 12 months for you guys has been wild. How do you plan to to meet with the demands? I mean, is there going to be like a, a code of ethics like you would see for golf or, or, or tennis involved in that to make it more inviting, but also to have more rules? Um, well, I, I think the rule, you know, the rule base that we have today is fairly, uh, it addresses, you know, all aspects of the, you know, the ethics of the sport. And, and um, I think the what really needs to happen is uh, as municipalities are trying to evaluate, you know, how do we address it? Um, there's essentially three different approaches that we've seen. Uh, one is a greenfield approach. Uh, um, municipalities like Wichita um, are, are bringing to uh, uh you know, bringing to a vote, uh, and it, which has been approved, a uh, three-phase facility, which is being purpose-built for pickleball over mm -hmm. the next couple of years. Um, I just got a, a, a note from the deputy mayor of Evansville, Indiana. Uh, they, After a year of work, uh, working with them, uh, they finally pulled the trigger on a new facility, which will basically be an expansion on a rackets facility. They've already got uh, 12 tennis courts. They'll be adding 16 pickleball courts with room to grow another eight afterwards. And then the last piece are conversions or uh, you know rehabbing uh, existing facilities or existing assets that may not be used uh, like they were before. There may but, have been um, disused tennis courts or basketball courts, which are being converted to pickleball as well. Carl, can I just ask you before we go, I mean, um, how do you prevent the sport from dying out? Because Americans are fickle and we like the new bright, shiny thing. And, I, you know, it, it's been, I, I just remember as a kid, Ultimate Frisbee. And um, be golf. Yeah, right. Uh, uh, you know, bocce was a thing for a while. Uh, what's the thing? Croquette. Like, yeah. you know, when we were little kids, yeah. we played a lot. Horseshoes. All things that Americans really get into for a period of time. And then after a little while, you're like, ah, you know, football, baseball, basketball. <laughs> How do you prevent, I guess, right. oversaturation? Because what we're talking about right now is like the game is hot and everybody's playing and everybody's interested in it. But how do you prevent it from sort of like, d you know, dying out essentially? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I come from the racquetball world, uh, you know, during its boom years and then its taper. Um, what what we're trying to do, we're uh, launching programs where we're looking at grassroots growth. So uh, there's several academic programs and, and uh, programs targeted for youth, which is vital to the growth of any sport. Um, clearly, you know, the aging population moving into the sport provides, a, you know, an ever, ever renewing <laughs> uh, 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 group of, of people playing. However, you know, we're looking at a much lower, uh, lower age uh, demographic that's starting to play. You'd mentioned youth, uh, you know, younger adults that are starting to play. It's one of our fastest growing sectors. Um, but uh, for, for children, uh, we believe there's a number of new programs that we're launching uh, that will help continue, uh, you know, continue to feed the, uh, the lower demographic uh, age groups and, and continue the sports growth over time. Carl Schmitz, thank you very much for your time. You bet. Thanks for having me on.